Chapter 9 Joseph Becomes the Apostle of Britain Arrives on the Sacred Isle of Avalon Taking their farewell of Philip and the faithful in Gaul, Joseph and the Bethany group of missionaries set sail for Britain in company with the Druidic delegation. Reaching its shores, the illustrious band sailed up the waterway of the west, the Severn Sea, until they came within sight of a lofty green hill, as Dean Alford writes, quote, most like to Tabor's holy mount, end quote, known to this day as Glastonbury Tor. They made their way up the estuary of the Brew and the Parrot, arriving at a cluster of islands about twelve miles inland from the coast. The most inspiring of these was the, quote, sacred Isle of Avalon, end quote, its shores sheltered in apple orchards. The isle derived its name from Aval, Celtic for apple, which was the sacred fruit of the Druids, the emblem of fertility. Thus its name applied a special symbolic significance to the spot destined to become the Mecca of Christendom. This was the manner of arrival of the saints in Britain. On this fruitful Isle of Avalon, Joseph of Arimathea and his dedicated companions were met by another assemblage of the friendly British Druidic priesthood, King Guiderius and his brother Arviragus, prince of the royal ciliars of Britain, and an entourage of nobles. The first act of Arviragus was to present to Joseph as a perpetual gift, free of tax, twelve hides of land, a hide for each disciple, each hide representing a hundred and sixty acres, a sum total of one thousand nine hundred and twenty acres. This was the first charter given to any land to be dedicated in the name of Jesus Christ, defining them as hallowed acres of Christendom, A.D. 36. It was the first of many charters this historic sacred spot was to receive during its sacred existence from the kings and queens of Britain. We find these charters officially recorded in the British Royal Archives, many are extant today, and over 1,000 years later we find in remarkable detail record of the original charter embodied in the Doomsday Book on recognition of William I, first Norman King of England, A.D. 1066. Throughout the reigns of the British sovereigns, these charters were the means of settling state, political, and religious disputes in refusing to recognize papal authority. Citation Usher, Britannicarum, Ecclesiarum, Antiquitates, Chapter 2 Proclaiming Britain's seniority to unbroken apostolic succession through its bishops, dating from St. Joseph, the Apostle to Britain, appointed and consecrated by the Apostle St. Philip, and, as we shall see, on orders arising from St. Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. Incidentally, the British claim of seniority was never denied by the Vatican popes, and was affirmed by papal statement as late as 1936. With the chartered gift of land to the Josephian mission, Arviragus promised his protection. With his brother, he led the first army in battle against Roman Christian persecution as defender of the faith, A.D. 43. King Lucius, A.D. 156, grandson of Arviragus, who renewed and enlarged the charter, was baptized many years earlier at Winchester by St. Timotheus. Citation Morgan, St. Paul in Britain, page 182 his uncle, who then proclaimed him, quote, defender of the faith, end quote. At this time, Roman Catholicism was not founded. It remained for the intrepid Queen Elizabeth, lineal descendant of Arviragus, to make the world-shaking declaration for the Reformation, when challenging the threats of the combined forces of France, Spain, and Rome by Pope Pius V, A.D. 1570, to subject Britain to Roman Catholicism. In her famous address from the throne, she rebuked and denounced papal authority. Alluding to the charters, she pronounced Britain's priority in the Christian Church. She made it a royal decree for the sovereigns of England on their coronation officially to take oath as, quote, defender of the faith, end quote. Citation. The title was conferred on Henry VIII and confirmed by Parliament in 1544. Personally, she declared, as her ancient ancestors had done, that only Christ was the head of the church. Ever since, on their coronation, the sovereigns of Britain have taken this oath, as did the Queen of the British Commonwealth, Elizabeth II, on her ascension to the British throne, A.D. 1953. On this occasion, the Roman Catholic Church petitioned for this oath to be omitted. It was stoutly refused, stating the British kingdom was the defender of the true Christian cause with Christ at its head. 
It is stated that following their disembarkation, the travelers made their way up the hill where it is reputed that Joseph, weary from his travel, stopped to rest, thrusting his staff into the ground. Tradition tells us that the staff became part of the earth, taking root, and in time blossomed. Historically, it is known as the holy thorn. From ancient times, it is referred to as a phenomenon of nature, being the only thorn tree in the world to bloom at Christmas time and in May. It endured throughout the centuries as a perpetual living monument to the landing of Britain's saintly disciples of Christ, and a reminder of the birth of Jesus in faraway Bethlehem. To this day, this spot bears the name it received in Joseph's time, Weary All Hill. For centuries, the phenomenon of the blooming thorn was looked upon as a miracle by the early devout Christians of Britain and as one could expect, the holy thorn provided critical opportunity to the 19th century scoffers. Modern science shows their ignorance. Tree experts affirm it is not only possible, but a natural process under favorable conditions for such a staff formed from the limb of a tree to take root and develop into a live, thriving tree. The strange blooming propensity of the thorn tree at Christmas, as well as in May, is something different but one we can accept as an act of God to remind us of the fulfillment of divine prophecy. The holy thorn continued to be world famous for its strange blossoming habit until the regime of Oliver Cromwell, A.D. 1649-60. through 60. During these years it was cut down by a fanatical Puritan when the Cromwellian desecration of holy places by his blind, bigoted followers was in operation. But the sacred phenomenon did not die. Its scion, already planted, lived to thrive and bloom as had the mother thorn tree. It can be seen today a healthy, fertile tree blooming gloriously at the same appointed seasons in the hallowed churchyard of St. John at Glastonbury, where the noble ruins of the Mother Church of Christendom stand. Nowhere in the world is there another similar tree enacting the same blossoming phenomenon. Its lovely snow-white petals spread out like a beacon in the midst of dead nature, its immaculate beauty looking skyward and mutely proclaiming that God still reigns in the heavens. Other shoots taken from this tree and grafted to wild stock bloom in the same manner. Within a mile of the sacred Isle of Avalon was another smaller island known as Innes Wytren, or Glass Island, a name some claim derived from the pure glassy waters that once surrounded it. Archaeologists provide the more probable answer. Excavations have revealed that it was once a busy site of the glass industry for which the ancient Britons were famous. Later, the Saxons named it Glastonbury, by which name it has continued to be known. During the Saxon period, the famed isles ceased to exist. The monks drained the land, making where the islands once stood a dry plain, though it is yet below water level and swampy in wet weather. Today, as you wander among the noble ruins of the glorious old abbey, you cannot escape the feeling of entrancement that touches your heart as you realize you are standing in the center of the hallowed twelve hides of land which the Silurian prince deeded to St. Joseph and his twelve companions. The beauty of the scene in this quiet little English town of Glastonbury, encircled by verdant meadows, all part of the dedicated 1,920 acres of Christendom, makes it difficult to get down to reality and comprehend the fact that one is walking on the same holy ground on which they trod, where they commune together, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, the beautiful Mary Magdalene, the Bethany sisters whom Christ loved, their brother Lazarus, Peter and Paul, Philip and James, Trophimus, Mary Cleopas, and Mary Salome, Aristobulus, the father-in-law of Peter, and Simon Zelotes, among a multitude of others, and where tradition asserts that Jesus built his wattle chapel, where he talked with God. Here countless pilgrims from all parts of the world made their vows. Here illustrious converts were confirmed and went forth into the world to preach the word and die gruesome deaths for the Christian cause. Here, for over a thousand years, mighty kings bowed in reverence and were buried with the elect in Christ. Within God's acre, you see embedded in the walls the ancient weather-worn stone which has mystified so many, causing centuries of controversy, mutely bearing the two sacred names, Jesus, Maria, 
first hewn and placed within the outer wall of the original stone church by the hands of the faithful saints. You see the ruined altar of St. Joseph of Arimathea, and just across the way the ancient cemetery which contains more famous characters and more dramatic history than all the cemeteries in the world put together. These magnificent ruins of Glastonbury Abbey are the remains of the beautiful church erected over the very spot where the uncle of Jesus and our Lord's own disciples built their first altar in a church of wattle thatched with reed as was the custom of that time. This was the first Christian church erected above ground to the glory of God and his son Jesus, dedicated to the Blessed Mary, his mother. Wattle was the common building material of the ancient Britons, used in the construction of their homes, just as cabins of log and mud and houses of sod were commonly built in the colonizing years of America and Canada. In building the first church of Christ in Wattle, Joseph and his companions did not employ unusual or inferior materials for the purpose, but only that which was then of the common order. We find proof of this in the book of The Church in These Islands Before Augustine, written by Rev. G. F. Brown, a former bishop of Bristol. Herein, the Rev. Brown refers to the excavations of Arthur Bullied, L.R.C.P. F.S.A., at Godney Marsh in 1892. Quote, this Waddle Church survived till after the Norman invasion when it was burned by accident. Wattle work is very perishable material, and of all things of the kind, the least likely would seem to be that we in the 19th century should, in confirmation of the story, discover at Glastonbury an almost endless amount of the British wattle work. Yet this is exactly what happened. Now occupying the place of the impenetrable marshes which gave the name of the Isle of Avalon to the higher ground, the eye of the local antiquary had long marked a mass of dome-shaped hillocks, some of them very considerable diameter, and about seventy in number, clustered together in what is now a large field, a mile and a quarter from Glastonbury. Peat had formed itself in the long course of time, and its preservative qualities had kept safe for our eyes that which it had enclosed and covered. The hillocks proved to be the remains of the British houses burned with fire. They were set on ground, made solid in the midst of the waters, with causeways for approach from the land. The faces of the solid ground and the sides of the causeways are re-vetted with wattle work. There is wattle all over, strong and very well made. The wattle, when first uncovered, is as good to all appearances as the day it was made. The houses of the Britons at Glastonbury, as a matter of fact, as long tradition tells us, and their church were made of wattles. End quote. Soon after Joseph and his apostolic company had settled in Avalon, painstakingly they began to build their wattle church. It was sixty feet in length and twenty-six feet wide, following the pattern of the tabernacle. The task was completed between A.D. 38 and 39. To those who followed after, every particle of clay and every reed was held sacred. To protect it from dissolution, and over it St. Paulinus, A.D. 630, erected the beautiful chapel of St. Mary's. It remained intact until the year A.D. 1184, when the great fire gutted the whole abbey to the ground, and with it perished the structure of the first Christian church above ground. The pattern of the Waddle Church was the model employed in the architecture of all the early British churches and perpetuated in many up to the present time. Within that humble Waddle Church, the first Christian instructions were given, and the first prayers and chants of praise to the glory of God and to His Son Jesus rang forth over the island. Sanctuary at last! Safe and free from the persecution of the Sanhedrin and the tyranny of pagan Rome, those faithful, fervent hearts taught the gospel of love and truth in all its original Christian beauty and humble simplicity. Protected by the valiant armed might of the invincible ciliaries, before whom the might of Rome was to tremble and crumble, the Apostle of Britain and his noble companions dedicated their lives and efforts in fulfilling the word of God through the teachings of the crucified Jesus in the quiet, restful sunlight of the English veils. British peoples the world over, Americans whose roots are British and Christians wherever they may be, should take a heart-throbbing pride in this monumental event. No wonder England is known as the motherland to the whole world. Hers is the womb of Christianity, out of which has sprung the world's most humane democracies. 
Proudly they proclaim the source, America and Britain are the only two nations that permit another flag to fly above their own national standard, and that flag is the flag of Christ, the church flag, more commonly known as the flag of St. George. By this act they proclaim to the rest of the world that they acknowledge Christ and the law of God. Back of the little wattle church rose the great tor, which was a druidic gorset or high place of worship, a hand-piled mound of earth vaster in its dimensions than the pyramid of Egypt. To this day the terraces that wind around the gorset to its summit can be traced. On such eminences the druids had their astronomical observatories from which they studied the heavens. In this knowledge, Greek and Roman alike extolled the Druids as the greatest teachers of this complicated science. There are many who maintain that the reason for the heartfelt, friendly welcome extended to the Josephian mission was because the Druids, simultaneously with the wise men of Persia, had discovered in the heavens the Star of Prophecy, which heralded the long-expected day-spring that was to lighten the world with the new dispensation, the glory of the star that should rise out of Jacob. This could be so. Prophecy has a way of revealing itself, in which case, to the Druidic priesthood, the discovery was but the revelation of the great event which they knew, equally with the Israelites of old, was to happen. The astounding fact is that whereas the Sadducean Judeans were never familiar with the name of the Messiah, it was a name familiar on the lips of every Briton. Citation C.F. Procipius de Gothicae, Book 3 the indisputable fact is that the Druids proclaim the name first to the world. The Lord our God is one. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Yesu. He is the King of glory. Narrator Note the verse is actually from Psalm 24, 9 through 10. The line which names the Lord Yesu has been inserted. How the Druidic priesthood knew the consecrated name so long beforehand is indeed a mystery in itself. The name Yesu was incorporated in the Druidic Trinity as the Godhead. In Britain, the name Jesus never assumed its Greek or Latin form. It was always the pure Celtic Yesu. It never changed. The more researchers study the Celtic Druidic religion, the more astonished they are with its similarity with that of old Israel. They taught it as a gospel of peace more faithfully than did their brethren in Israel. Wars, hatreds, persecution, and family separation had never divided them as it had the Israelites of Judea. To the members of the Arimathean mission, the British environment must have appeared as a true haven of happiness after all their bitter experiences. To the Druids, the advent of the Josephian Chaldees was but a confirmation of the atonement. They did not need to take up the cross. It was already with them, a familiar symbol in their religious rituals. The early British Christians never employed the Latin cross. Their cross combined the Druidic symbol with the cross. Even today, the Celtic cross appears on the peaks and spires of many Anglican churches throughout the world. The Druidic circle embracing the cross is the symbol of eternity. The cross is the symbol of victory over the grave, through the salvation bought by the vicarious atonement. The merging of the British Druidic Church with Christianity was a normal procedure, peacefully performed. Those who state that Christianity was bitterly opposed by the Druids speak falsely. Nowhere in the Celtic records is there any mention of opposition. The Druidic archbishops recognized that the old order was fulfilled according to prophecy, and with the coming of Christ and his atonement, the new dispensation had arrived. In this light of understanding, Druids and Judean apostles marched forward together, firmly wedded in the name of Christ. It was never marred with the persecution, bloodshed, and martyrdom that accompanied the teaching of the Christ gospel in Rome. The former president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, truly said, quote, All histories should be rewritten in truth. End quote. School history books still erroneously teach that the Augustan mission, sent by Pope Gregory, A.D. 596, marked the introduction of Christianity into Britain. Actually, it is the date of the first attempt to introduce the papacy into Britain. Therein lies both error and confusion. The Vatican has always been more emphatic in correcting this mistake than have the Protestant denominations. 
Baronius and Alfred, the two foremost historians of the Vatican, each referring to ancient documents in the Vatican Library, affirm St. Joseph as the Apostle of Britain and the first to introduce Christian teachings in the island. The popes have also substantiated this statement. In 1931, Pope Pius XI received at the Vatican the visiting English Roman Catholic mayors of Bath, Colchester, and Dorchester, along with the 150 members of the Friends of the Italy Society. In his address to them, the Pope said that St. Paul, not Pope Gregory, first introduced Christianity into Britain. This statement is quoted from the report made in the London Morning Post, March 27, 1931. The Pope spoke the truth. In fact, St. Paul was authoritatively the first to deliver the message from Rome, though actually his appointed representative, Aristobulus, preceded him. The important point to remember here is that St. Joseph did not go to Britain from Rome. He went direct from Palestine via Marseille and preceded St. Paul in Britain by 20 years. At the ecclesiastical councils of the Roman Catholic Church, the religious representatives of each country were accorded honor of place at the council in the order that each had received Christianity. Due to the bitter envy some of the countries bore towards the British, they vigorously sought to dispute Britain's precedence in priority, but on each occasion Britain's position was defended by Vatican authority. Theodore Martin of Louvain writes of these disputes in Disputolis Super Dignitatum Anglis et Gallio in Concilio Constantiano, A.D. 1517. Quote, three times the antiquity of the British Church was affirmed in ecclesiastical councilla. 1. The Council of Pisa, A.D. 1417. 2. Council of Constance, A.D. 1419. 3. Council of Siena, A.D. 1423. It was stated that the British Church took precedence of all other churches being founded by Joseph of Arimathea immediately after the Passion of the Christ. End quote. The erudite Bishop Usher writes in Britannicarum Ecclesiarum Antiquitates, quote, The British National Church was founded in A.D. 36, 160 years before heathen Rome confessed Christianity. End quote. The founding of Christianity in Britain by the Josephian mission was truly the beginning of the British National Church. Conversion spread rapidly through the Isles. It is recorded A.D. 48 that Connor Manessa, King of Ulster, sent his priests to Avalon to commit the Christian law and its teachings into writing, which they named, quote, the Celestial Judgments, end quote. Citation. C.F. Lewis, St. Joseph of Arimathea at Glastonbury, also Old History of Ulster, Irish Tourist Bureau. However, it was not until A.D. 156 that Britain, by the royal edict of King Lucius, officially proclaimed the Christian Church to be the National Church of Britain, at Winchester, then the royal capital of Britain. Quoting from Augustinicio Mission, A.D. 597, it reads, quote, Britain officially proclaimed Christian by King Lucius at National Council at Winchester, 156 A.D., end quote. Winchester was the ancient capital of Britain where its kings were crowned for over 1,500 years. It was founded 500 B.C. There is no lack of evidence among the earliest writers, many of whom were citizens of nations hostile to Britain, confirmation of the facts by them, and by prelates of the powerful religion opposed to the British Church, cannot be denied on any pretext. St. Clement of Rome, A.D. 30-100, refers to the disciples in Britain in the Epistle to the Corinthians. As we turn the pages of the Demonstratio Evangelica by Eusebius of Caesarea, we read the potent passage, quote, The apostles passed beyond the ocean to the isles called the Britannic Isles, end quote. Tertullian of Carthage, A.D. 208, tells us that in his time the Christian church, quote, extended to all the boundaries of Gaul and parts of Britain inaccessible to the Romans, but subject to Christ, end quote. Sibelius, A.D. 250, writes this important passage, quote, Christianity was privately confessed elsewhere, but the first nation that proclaimed it as their religion and called it Christian after the name of Christ was Britain, end quote. Origen, in the third century, wrote, quote, The power of our Lord is with those who in Britain are separated from our coasts, end quote. The famed and benevolent St. Jerome, A.D. 378, writes, quote, From India to Britain, all nations resound with the death and resurrection of Christ, end quote. 
Arnobius, A.D. 400, adds his trenchant, trenchant message, writing, quote, So swiftly runs the word of God, that within the space of a few words his word is concealed, neither from the Indians in the east, nor from the Britons in the west, end quote. Chrysostom, the venerable patriarch of Constantinople, A.D. 402, potently pens in his Cerno de Utilit, quote, The British Isles, which are beyond the sea and which lie in the ocean, have received virtue of the word. Churches are there found and altars erected. Thou thou shouldest go to the ocean, to the British Isles, there thou shouldest hear all men everywhere discoursing matters out of scriptures, with another voice indeed, but not another faith with a different tongue, but the same judgment, end quote. In later years, the confirmation continues undenied and unabated. Polydor Virgil, an eminent Roman Catholic divine who wrote during the denunciations and quarrels between the Pope and Henry VIII of England, quote, Britain partly through Joseph of Arimathea, partly through Fugitus and Damianus, was of all the kingdoms the first to receive the gospel, end quote. Another Roman Catholic leader, the Rev. Robert Parsons, definitely states in his book, The Three Conversions of England, quote, The Christian religion began in Britain, end quote. Sir Henry Spellman, the eminent scholar, writes in his Concilia, quote, We have abundant evidence that this Britain of ours received the faith, and that from the disciples of Christ himself, soon after the crucifixion, end quote. And the famed Taliesin, A.D. 500-540, through 540, one of Britain's greatest scholars, Celtic Archdruid and Prince Bard, forthrightly declares that though the gospel teaching was new to the rest of the world, it was also known to the Celtic British. He writes, quote, Christ, the word from the beginning, was from the first our teacher, and we never lost his teachings. Christianity was a new thing in Asia, but there never was a time when the Druids of Britain held not its doctrines, end quote. Gildas, A.D. 520, Britain's foremost early historian, wrote in his De Exidio Britannio, quote, We certainly know that Christ, the true Son, afforded his light, the knowledge of his precepts, to our island in the last year of Tiberius Caesar. He also wrote the following most important statement, quote, Joseph introduced Christianity into Britain in the last year of the reign of Tiberius, end quote. Tiberius was the Roman emperor against whom Pontius Pilate plotted with others the secret knowledge of which Caiaphas had used to compel Pilate to carry out the evil will of the Sadducean Sanhedrin to crucify Jesus. Tiberius reigned for twenty-two years. The crucifixion of Christ took place in the seventeenth year of his reign, A.D. 32 according to the reckoning of their time, and A.D. 33 according to our present reckoning. The last year of Tiberius's reign, being his twenty-second, would be, according to the respective calendars, A.D. 37 and A.D. 38. Thus, the general agreement that the gospel was transplanted to Britain within five years of the Passion is in accord with the dates recorded. To all this is added absolute confirmation that Joseph of Arimathea was the one who first brought Christianity to Britain, and was the first and truly appointed apostle to and of the British. Probably the statements quoted herein will appear revelatory to many, particularly those saturated with the unreliable, impotent theories of schoolbook historians. The references are beyond dispute and are only a fraction of the mass available. They substantiate the fact that Joseph and the Arimathean mission in Britain was known the world over and in all cases accurately reported long before the Roman Catholic Church was founded at Rome. Later, when the Vatican had become established, popes, prelates, and historians of the Roman Catholic See freely confirmed the record. From the dates given, it will be seen that many of the authorities quoted, both secular and ecclesiastical, lived before and during the epochal period of our story. Others quoted lived close enough to the era to be familiar with Britain and its inhabitants. The ever-rising mass of confirmation from the turn of this century to the present time is proof of the zealous research of scholars and scientists in reaffirming the ancient truth and lifting the curtain of error and misinformation which unqualified and indifferent writers of the last century had clouded with the unstable dogma of myth and legend. Undoubtedly, they acted under the influence of atheism, which staggered religious belief during the Victorian era and to a certain extent still lingers to mislead too many. 
the vicious invectives of the higher critics of, quote, Germany, unquote, are squelched along with the fraudulent distortion of Darwin's treatise of evolution by Henrik Heyerlich, pseudoscientist nakedly exposed by the German Institute of Science and the Lutheran Church, along with the destructive interpretation of socialism by Karl Marx from which communism has sprung. Today, communism gives the old propaganda a new dress, but it is the same villain, deliberately distorting the true principles of the Western democracies. The Britons of our Lord's time were no more barbarian or painted savages than are the modern English-speaking nations war-mad barbarians, as the Soviet press describes us. Educationally, the Celtic British ranked among the highest to be found anywhere. Each city had its university apart from the special druidic seats of learning. In AD 110, Ptolemy states that there existed 56 large cities, Marciana states there were 59, and Chrysostom states with the acceptance of the new order of the way, a greater impetus was given to the erection of seats of learning. To this great work, the converted British prince, Arviragus, then a young, unmarried man, along with the rest of the royal Silurian families in England and Wales, gave the fullness of their support. Quoting from the ancient British chronicles, we obtain an interesting picture of the conversion of Arviragus by Joseph. Joseph converted this king Arviragus by his preaching to know ye laws divine, and baptized him as right hath Nennius, the chronicler in Britain tongue full fine, and to Christian laws made him in line, and gave him then a shield of silver white, a cross and long, and overthwart full perfect. These arms were used throughout all Britain for a common sign, each man to know his nation, and thus his arms by Joseph creation, full long afore St. George was generate, were worshipped here of Michael Elder Date. Citation Harding's Chronicle It is interesting to note in this verse that Joseph, on the conversion of Arviragus, gave him as a sign for all nations to know, quote, the long cross, end quote, as his coat of arms, then customarily worn on the shield of the chieftain. This is the first record of the cross officially becoming the symbol of a king. The reason is plain. It was given to King Arviragus as a sign and declaration that he was the elected Christian king. And of added interest, given as the writer states, long before St. George, the patron saint of England, was born. This symbol, representing the flag of St. George, and known as such today, was inherited from Arviragus. Its religious significance is still dominant, being the accepted church flag of the present Protestant church. Since the time of Arviragus, it has always been the Christian flag of the British church. Protestantism had nothing to do with it. Actually, it is a mistake to name all Christian denominations separate from the Roman Catholic Church Protestants. The name arose out of other religious sects appearing later in Britain, which protested against the ritualism of the original British Church. In fact, the name applies to the religious sects still holding to the Christian faith who are known today as the Free Churches, meaning free of ritualism of any kind. Up to and during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, there was only one religion in Britain. Throughout the Isles, it was known as the British Church, and so known to the rest of the world. It was also known as the Holy Catholic Church, and never Roman Catholic. When Elizabeth and her Parliament struck back at the powerful forces of the Papal States, France, Spain, and Rome, the Papal See was so determinedly denounced that a cleavage was created that left no doubt in the minds of people for all time to come that the British Church, as at the beginning, had no association with the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Both the British Church and the State determined on a reformation within the British Church to exclude anything and everything that bore any comparison with the Roman Catholic Church in liturgy and in ritual. Certain Roman innovations had crept into the British Church over the years. The order to reform began, returning to the original concept. Therefore, it was not a protest creating Protestantism. It was, as the historic act declares, a cleansing reformation of the British Church. Since then, the separation has been positive. The British Church was still the national religion of the Isles. Shortly after, the religion began to take on its own native national title, becoming the Church of England, the Church of Wales, the Church of Scotland, and the Church of Ireland, all holding the same communion, designating themselves as holy Catholics as separate from Roman Catholics. 
Thus, Holy Catholic means a universal, holy Christian Church, with Christ alone being the sole head of the Church. The Roman Catholic Church designates itself as the universal Christian Church of the Romans, with the Pope as its head. This the British Church would never recognize. In the United States of America, prior to the Revolution, the established Church was the Church of England. Following the Revolution, the name was changed to the Episcopal Church of America of the Anglican Communion. It is still so known, maintaining the original service and communion of the Mother Church. The German Lutheran Church service also observes a great similarity. All the named churches are Episcopalian, meaning a church government by bishops. In this manner, the original Christian church was created by the apostles, who appointed bishops to govern the Christian church. The present Mother British Church is the only Christian church that has maintained an unbroken apostolic succession of bishops from the beginning, with all the named Episcopal churches sharing in this distinction. Protestantism is claimed by many to have arisen with the protests of Martin Luther against the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church. In this case, the word could be applied, for at that time, Germany had long been part of the Holy Roman Empire, with the Emperor of Germany the appointed representative of the Pope. Britain was never part of this empire, and never nationally under the domination of the Vatican. It was from the beginning to this day, British, the Church of the Covenant People. Christianity was founded in Britain A.D. 36. The first Christian church above ground was erected A.D. 38-39. through 39. The Roman Catholic hierarchy was founded circa A.D. 350, after Constantine, and not until centuries later was the papal title created. Until then, the head of the Roman Catholic Church was still a bishop. The title of Pope, or Universal Bishop, was first given to the Bishop of Rome by the wicked Emperor Phocas in the year A.D. 610. This he did to spite Bishop Syriacus of Constantinople, who had justly excommunicated him for his having caused the assassination of his predecessor, Emperor Moritus. Gregory I, then Bishop of Rome, refused the title, but his successor, Boniface III, first assumed the title of Pope. Jesus did not appoint Peter to the headship of the apostles and expressly forbade any such notion, as stated in Luke chapter 22 verses 24 through 26, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 through 23, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11. Returning to the history of the cross as the Christian symbol of royal heraldry and given to Arvirgus by Joseph, the cross on the shield up to the present time has remained the special symbol of the sovereigns of Britain. In later times, the lion was superimposed on the shield, as shown today. The lion was the emblem of Judah, keeper of the sanctuary, but, as Christ said, it would be taken away from them and given to another who would keep the law. This symbol appearing on the British royal arms with the cross is significant. The cross denotes that the British were the first to accept Christ and by keeping the law inherited the kingdom of God taken from the nation of the mongrelized Jews. Arvirigus was to carry the banner of the cross through the most bitterly fought battles between the Britons and the Romans. In spite of the fact that the early Christian and Roman records abound with the name and warrior fame of Arvirigus, he is entirely lost to the later histories. His fame is overshadowed by his famous cousin, Caractacus, and the most famous Christian warrior in history, not accepting his illustrious descendant, the Emperor Constantine. The royal boundaries of the Silures were divided into two sections. Arvirigus ruled over the southern part of England, and Caradoc, or Caractacus, over Cambria, the region that is now Wales. Each was king in his own special domain, but in time of war they united under a pendragon, or commander-in-chief, agreed upon by the people. At that time they represented the most powerful warrior clan in Britain. Arvirigus ruled as Pendragon, while his cousin Caractacus was captive in Rome, conducting the war against the empire for years. Citation. Tacticus, Annals, Book 5, Chapter 28. So, conducting the war against the empire for years in Britain in a matter that gained for him immortal fame exceeding that of Caractacus. Juvenal, the Roman writer, in his works, clearly indicates how greatly the Romans feared Arvirigus, stating that his name trembled on the lips of every Roman, and that no better news could be received at Rome than the fall of this royal Christian Silurian. 
He writes, asking, quote, Hath our great enemy Arviragus, the car-born British king, dropped from his battle throne? End quote. Edmund Spencer adds his tribute, quote, Was never king more highly magnified, nor dread of Romans, was than Arviragus? End quote. Despite the fact that the Romans were the implacable foe of the British and sought by every means at their command in their vicious hatred to exterminate the Christian faith at its source, they held the British warriors in high esteem, holding that their religion was the reason for their fearlessness in battle and disdain of death. Julius Caesar wrote circa 54 BC, quote, They make the immortality of the soul the basis of all their teaching, holding it to be the principal incentive and reason for a virtuous life. Believing in the immortality of the soul, they were careless of death. End quote. Citation Gallic War, Chapter 1, Section 1. Behind this heroic warrior wall of protection, Joseph and the disciples of Christ were safe from harm, free to preach and teach the glorious faith on the sacred isle of Avalon. To the Britons this was hallowed ground, and they died willingly to preserve the first planting of the Christian way, so that it might thrive and blossom to bless the whole world. There was to be a second separate planting of the Christ seed in Britain about twenty years after Joseph's arrival. Independent of the Josephian mission, it was also to be sponsored by the Royal Silurian House in Wales by the father and family of Caractacus under the commission of St. Paul. It originated at Rome, where the same family were to be the divinely ordained instruments of St. Paul in developing his great mission as directed by Christ. After contact with them, he declares it in his statement, quote, I turn henceforth to the Gentiles, end quote. This royal British family at Rome were to provide the Christian story with its greatest romance, its greatest drama, and its most terrible tragedy. They were destined to be the first martyrs to suffer for Christ in the Gentile church and millions more were to follow later. Believe it or not, the British have paid the greatest blood sacrifice in all history in the defense and for the preservation of the Christian church, more so than all other nations put together. The underground cemeteries of Rome, the catacombs, are packed with their tortured, murdered bodies, men, women, and children. The soil of Britain is saturated with their blood, eternal testimony to their undying faith. Knowing that Christ died for them, they were fearless in dying for Christ.